This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, good morning everybody and thank you for taking the time to come to, to this talk. It's my pleasure to tell you some of the work we're, we have been doing for the past probably 10, 20 years already uh, in regards of understanding what's the function structure and how uh, is the regulation of a particular set of membrane transport proteins that mediate uh, response, response to tolerance uh, of a particular set of abiotic stress. What I'm showing you here is a world map, a heat map of the density of crop areas uh, nowadays in the world. It's pretty clear. Come on. Okay, when you look at at the at the soils, the suitability of soils, it's pretty clear that there's a nice correlation where there's a high density of agriculture taking place with the quality of the soils around the world. So it's no big surprise. We basically do agriculture where the soils are good. However, when you take into account that by 2050, our population is increasing by about 25%, and just in about 20 years or so, we need to increase uh, our production by 40%. It's obvious that we have to start thinking about moving into these marginal soils and start increasing the productivity that is currently taking place in this sort of mar marginal soils where the soils are not suitable for agriculture. So these marginal soils are a result of uh, several abiotic stresses, including drought, salinity, and uh, also aluminum toxicity. And to tell you why aluminum toxicity is such an in important abiotic stress, I'll first overlap a heat map uh, describing the pH of the soils around the world. Acidic pHs are shown in red. Mm, so in terms of the total area of the world, about 30% of the total uh, soils in the world are acidic, and that constitutes about 70% of the potentially arable lands uh, around the world, which includes the, so the south and tropical band, which takes into account uh, particular regions where food, uh, food supply and, and food uh, stability is, is more tenuous at the moment. So why is aluminum toxicity occurring in this, in this kind of acidic soils? Aluminum is pretty harmless at neutral and, and uh, basic pHs because it's bound to, to the oxides and the silica in the soil. However, when you start hitting uh, low pHs, acidic pHs, aluminum solubilizes into the solution. And as the pH becomes more acidic, what happens is the predominant form that you'll find of aluminum in the solution, in the rhizosphere, is Al3+, plus, and it's this particular form of aluminum which is actually phytotoxic to plants. So, oh, I have that. So, how toxic is it really? Let me just show you a couple of examples. These are two maize varieties grown in the southern part of Brazil in acidic soils. As you can see, there's an aluminum-resistant variety and aluminum-sensitive. The sensitive variety actually has a significant uh, loss of yield. Likewise, this is uh, two contrasting varieties from wheat. The aluminum sensitive variety, what you can see, is a really dramatic inhibition or loss of the root growth. And that's the primary, that's the primary symptom of aluminum toxicity. Aluminum, as soon as you expose the roots to aluminum, the root growth ceases. <coughs> what that results in is a, a loss of water uptake, loss of uh, mineral uptake and ultimately what, what it translates into is this <coughs> loss of yields. So this is just a micrograph showing you the degree of injury that roots actually experience upon exposure to aluminum. These are the same wheat varieties I'm showing you right here. So fortunately there is a, a generic variation in crop plant species which we can exploit to understand what are the physiological mechanisms that underlie this this aluminum resistance process. And for most crops, what has been found, it was early described back in the early 90s, is that those aluminum resistant varieties, actually upon exposure to aluminum, the roots rele release organic acids into the rhizosphere. What these organic acids do is they complex the aluminum, they chelate it, and they form complexes that A, are not toxic, and B, are not taken up by the root. That way, they're excluding aluminum from coming into the root system and uh, have its uh, phytotoxic events. So as I said, this was originally described in wheat. Subsequently, we describe it in maize. 
but has uh, nowadays been uh, reported as a very highly conserved mechanism throughout a whole variety of crop species. So overall, aluminum resistance in plants can be, can be achieved by an exclusion mechanism such as the one I just described, which is the release of organic acids into the rhizosphere, forming non-toxic complexes, or true tolerance or detoxification mechanisms. If aluminum is able to get across the, across the plasma membrane of the root cells, it can form complexes uh, with organic acids, which are sequestered into the vacuole of the roots and stored there in a non-toxic uh, form. Or in some cases, it, it can actually be loaded into a xylem, translocated into, into, the, into the shoots where it's sequestered. In. And this is the case of uh, plants which are aluminum hyperaccumulators, such as the case of, um, of tea crops. So for the purpose of this talk, all I'm focusing on is what I'm gonna talk about is uh, aluminum exclusion mechanisms. And particularly, I'm gonna talk about these two transporters or the nature of these transporters here. So the major breakthrough in terms of uh, understanding what was the molecular identity of the transporters mediating this release of organic acids came back in 2004, about 10 years ago, by, by Sasaki et al. in Japan. And uh, they basically cloned a novel transporter, which they called aluminum activated male transporter, or ALMT, in wheat in 2004. In 2007, Leon's group actually cloned the second aluminum uh, tolerance gene, and what they found out is there is an additional transporter, or an additional family of transporters. They cloned it from sorghum, and it's a family of transporters from the multi drug toxic compound extrusion family, or MATES. These two transporters are very different in terms of uh, their secondary structure, their structure and the way they function. These are predominantly anion channel type of transporters while these are sort of antiporters. So in terms of uh, signal transduction, it's a very complex uh, network of signal transduction cascades which basically the aluminum uh, stress is sent and there's a whole a bunch of transcriptional regulation going on, which ultimately affects the expression of these two, two transporters, the LMTs and the mates. However, what I'm interested in talking about today is how are these transporters actually post-translated regulated. In other words, we're, I'm not interested in, in finding out what's, what's the gene uh, at, the at the gene level, what is the transcriptional regulation of these transporters, but the protein itself, how does it work? How does it mediate the release of organic acid and can the protein actually respond by itself to the presence of extracellular aluminum. So I'm gonna to focus today on the ALMTs and I'll leave the, the, the mate story for another opportunity. So the wheat ALMT was cloned back in 2004 and it said the, it was the, the first ALMT characterized at that time and thus they gave it the name of aluminum activated male release channel. Since then we know that they're expressing the root tips and subsequently, we and other groups were involved in the cloning of homolog uh, genes to LMT1, which these genes are, in fact, involved in aluminum resistance. They mediate the release of organic acids, and they're associated with the aluminum resistance response. However, nowadays, we know that the LMT family is not just uh, anion channels uh, involved in aluminum resistance, but they're involved in other physiological processes. There are LMTs that are expressed in guard cells, so they're involved in, in the regulation of guard cells. There are other LMTs that are, that are expressed in roots, and they are involved in, the, in mineral nutrition and, and general uptake. From a phylogenetic point of view, from the genome sequence projects, we're able to establish that uh, the LMT family is pretty much divided into five different clades with the set of uh, aluminum resistance related ALMTs belonging to clade one. Now this is the only set of ALMTs thus far that has been functionally characterized. This is just based in a genome sequencing projects. From a secondary structure point of view, most ALMTs have a conserved structure which consists of the first half of the protein contains about six transmembrane domains with the other half of the protein being more uh, hydrophilic and containing a it's about half of the protein, which is a, a highly hydrophilic region, which I'll talk later about. So given the similarity in the structure of all these ALMTs, what we're interested in finding out is 
what makes a given LMT like this, a LMT that is related to the aluminum resistant phenotypes that we observe? We know that there are some LMTs that are actually expressed in roots, but they're not related to the aluminum resistance. So there must be something about this particular set of LMTs that allow them to confer aluminum resistance phenotype in plants. So for this purpose, what we've been doing is we've been doing structural and functional analysis of particular of the, the wheat ALMT1. What we do is we use a functional, uh, we use heterologous expression in oocytes. What we can do is we can generate, we, we can express the, the transporter, or we can generate using conventional molecular biology tools. We can generate different chimeras or single point mutations, truncations, and so on. Just express them in the oocytes. We can generate cRNA. We inject the cRNA into the oocyte cell, which is about one millimeter in diameter, so it's really convenient in terms of doing microinjections. These cells express the, the cRNA. They translate it. They place your transporter in the cell, and you can perform either functional studies using conventional electrophysiological techniques, such as two electro voltage clamp, or you can do structural, uh, structural studies using uh, taking advantage, advantage of different fluorochromes. What this allows us to do is perform the functional and structural studies, set hypotheses in terms of we are expecting in terms of the relation of the structure to the function of these transporters, and test, test our, our hypothesis by generating different versions or structurally modifying the LMT and seeing what its impact in the functionality of that transport protein is. So first, given the, let me just take you back one slide. Given the fact that this uh, ALMT mediates the release of organic acids upon exposure to aluminum, what we're interested to see first was what's the interaction of aluminum with the actual transporter. And for that reason, the first step we have to take is to determine what is the topology of the LMT across the plasma membrane. Is this side facing the cytosolic side or is it facing the apo apoplasmic side of, of the membrane? in terms of which is the part of the protein that first sees the aluminum and experiences the presence of, of the AL3+. So to carry on the, the membrane topology studies of LMT, what we have developed is a technique where we have taken advantage of the pH sensitivity of the GFP in such a way that the intensity of the fluorescence of the emission of the GFP is pH dependent such that when you start hitting acidic pHs, the emission of the GFP or the intensity is quenched down, it's reduced. So what we first developed was a method where we can monitor the intracellular pH of the oocyte using a small uh, pH microelectrode. So we impale those cells with the pH microelectrode and we establish a set of extracellular solutions where, which we perfuse on, on the outside of the oocyte and measure the changes in pH that occur internally in the oocyte. And this is what we observe. As we change the extracellular pH from 7.5 through 7.5 plus sodium acetate or extracellular pH of 5, we maintain a relatively constant intracellular pH. However, when we put sodium, uh, extracellular solution of pH 5 plus sodium acetate, sodium acetate is a weak acid which dissociates at pH 5, permeabilizes the membrane of the oocyte, gets inside, and, and yields this intracellular acidification in the oocyte. So having established this methodology, we look at what's, what's the change in the relative fluorescence of the GFP through this, this uh, set of solutions. And what I'm showing you here is a confocal image of, uh, of the edge of the oocyte as it's being bathed through this different set of solutions. So at 7.5, is it running? Yep, basically the, the intensity of the GFP doesn't change. And as soon as we put in 5.0 plus sodium acetate, what we obtain is a quenching of the GFP. So we have a nice system where we can correlate changes in, in the intensity of the GFP with changes in intracellular pH. So that we, we can use that as an indicator of potentially where, where is the GFP found. In this case, obviously, the soluble GFP is found in the intracellular space. We did the same with a particular transporter, AT mate, by tagging it in the end terminus with the GFP and what we obtain is a similar pattern to that described for the soluble GFP. We know that that 
that the N-terminal domain of the AT mate is located in the inside. So we have a good indication that our technique is working. Now we use a negative control using OPT3, a transporter that uh, we heard about early this year, a talk given by Elena. And uh, we tagged it at the C terminus. We know that the, thank you. We know that the C terminus of, of that transporter is, is located to the outside. And just as you would expect, when you bath it through the different set of conditions we have, there's no change in the first two solutions, but as soon as there's pH 5 in the extracellular space, we quench the GFP. So we have a nice system to show, to basically use the GFP of an indicator of is that particular N terminus or C terminus located to the intracellular space or the apoplasmic space of the transporter. Using this approach, we took our gene of interest, the wheat LMT1, we first tag it in the, C, in the N terminus, and what we obtain is pretty much the similar behavior to what we obtain for the soluble GFP, indicating that this particular GFP here is, is facing or is located in the interstellar space of the cell. We've taken the same approach with transporters tagged at the C terminus. We know that this C terminus is actually located into the inside of the cell. We know that the end of the transmembrane domain 6 is also located to, to the inside of the cell. And there was some controversy about the potential existence of additional transmembrane domains around this region. What we've done is we've taken the GFP and we've flanked those different transmembrane domains, and we found that uh, the GFP is located towards the inside, indicating that there's no transmembrane domain region there, even though it might be a, a highly hydrophobic region, it might be involved in the anchoring of the protein, rather than actually constituting a domain which transverses the, the lipid bilayer. So, having est established the topology of the protein, the next thing we're interested in, in uh, understanding is how does the protein assemble? Does the, the channel work as a single subunit, so one single subunit of ALMT is functionally active, or does it assemble as a multimeric uh, transporter in such a way that you require the assembly of several subunits to form the actual functional channel? For this purpose, we have used BIFC, pretty much a well-established technique by now, We've tagged the subunits of ALMT with the two complementary halves of the YFP, and what we, we get is complementation of the YFP at the plasma membrane, indicating that ALMT, the ALMT subunits are actually interacting. We've also tagged uh, the subunits in, in opposite directions with half of the, of the YFP attached to the end, the other half attached to, to the C terminus, and we also obtain complementation, suggesting once again that the C terminus and the N terminus are facing in the same in, in the same compartment, the cytoplasm of, of the cell. So we know that the LMT subunits interact. The next thing we're, we were wondering is what's the stoichiometry of LMT? So are two subunits interacting or is the, the transporter consisting of three or four subunits interacting? For this purpose, we're collaborating with uh, the Isakov lab in uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, what they use is they use uh, turf microscopy to, to address this particular question. So the first step we had to do was prove that their technique actually is suitable for studying uh, plant membrane transporters, not just, just suitable for studying animal channel transporters. So what we did is we tagged uh, CAT1 with a GFP. CAT1 is a potassium channel from Arabidopsis, and there's, there's good knowledge about the structure and the assembly of, of this type of potassium channels. What we've shown is that the functional properties of the intact CAT1 resemble those of the CAT tagged with the GFP. So the addition of the GFP is not affecting the functionality of the transporter. When we express that transporter in all sites and in a low density, under the turf microscope, what you can observe is actually single GFP molecules that are being photobleached. Single uh, single GFP molecule emissions. When you look in, in detail to, to a particular set of, of those single spots, and I'm just going to show you, I want to focus on, on this red region here. What we can do is we can actually measure the changes in intensity that take place in that particular spot as the, as the GFP is being quenched by, by the laser. So basically what we get is a high intensity point, and as the GFP is being bleached, you lose the signal. 
And that's what's being quantified here over a period of about 20 seconds. Now what you see is that the change in intensity actually occurs in four very discrete steps. It's not a continuous behavior, but you have four different steps or discrete changes. What that is telling you is that you actually have four GFP molecules that are emitting in that particular spot. Four GFP molecules, each one attached to one of the subunits of CAT1. In other words, what that's telling you is in every single spot that you look at, what you're finding is CAT1 assembled as a tetramer, consisting of, of the four subunits. And this is what actually forms the functional transporter of CAT1. Four subunits assemble in such a way that this, this region in the middle actually consists of the permeation pathway or the pore of the transporter. So knowing that we can actually use this technique for, for plant cells, what we did is we implemented it for the ALMT1 and other ALMTs, and what we obtained is that the transporters actually assemble as a dimer. <coughs> so this is the functional state of the transporter. We've done this for not only the wheat ALMT, we know that it, um, that it also happens for the Arabidopsis, for the maize ALMT. So apparently the dimer state is conserved throughout the entire ALMT family. So what I've shown you so far is those structural studies that we've done, uh, basically just coming out from a secondary structure, we're able to know more or less the topology of the LMT across the membrane, which part faces the cytoplasm, which part faces the extracellular side. We know that it assembles as a dimer. Now what we're interested in, in finding out are uh, what are what are the functional properties of this LMT, and how do those functional properties correlate with the structure? or the secondary structure prediction. So for that purpose, once again, what we're doing is we're expressing our protein of interest in the oocytes. We're able to load the oocytes with the substrate, in this case, malate. We microinject the cells with malate a couple of hours prior to doing the electrophysiological recordings. And we use two electro voltage clamp to study the activity of that transporter expressed across the plasma membrane. To, to put it in simple terms, what we do is the cell is so big, it's one millimeter in diameter, we're able to impale two microelectrodes on it. With one microelectrode, we are able to impose a voltage across the plasma membrane of the cell. With the other microelectrode, what we're able to do is we're able to record the currents that are elicited or that happen at that particular holding potential. Those currents are simply the movement of, of ions across the plasma membrane. A current is just the transport, the transport of ions across the plasma membrane. So let me show you what happens in uh, control cells. By control cells, I mean cells that have not been injected with the RNA, so they are not expressing the transporter, versus what happens with cells that have been injected with the ALMT transporter. So here I'm showing you a holding potential of minus 100 millivolts. This is the magnitude of the current. Again, it's simply a it, it just relates to the amount of transport that's taking place. Control cells so, show a very small current, very basal endogenous transport taking place across the plasma membrane. And LMTs, in the absence of aluminum, mediate a slightly larger transport in those cells. However, what's really important is that upon just adding aluminum to the bath, so you basically you replace the bath medium for the same solution, but now it includes uh, about 20 micromolar aluminum chloride, what you get is a very relatively quick, it happens within a couple of minutes, a very quick enhancement of the transport activity mediated by aluminum, by, by LMT, sorry. So here, basically we have a transporter that is not at the regulatory, it's not at the transcription level, but actually it just happens within minutes. So basically the transporter somehow is sensing the presence of aluminum. The fact that uh, aluminum interacts with the transporter changes, it const uh, changes the conformational state and it surrenders the transporter in a more active state. So this is another way of, of uh, looking at the transport activity of ALMTs. So rather than holding, holding the, the membrane potential for a long period of time, what we can do is we can just uh, look at the transport activity over a small period of time of about 600 milliseconds 
at a given voltage, say minus 100, milli, uh, hun minus 140 millivolts. We measure the magnitude of the transport at that particular uh, voltage, and then we just keep changing the holding potential to smaller and smaller, less negative holding potentials, and we keep measuring the transport activity at those particular voltages. So once again, these are just traces superimposed or current magnitude superimposed at different holding potentials. Once again, control cells show a very small transport activity. They still have some transport activity, and it's obvious it's, it's the transport activity from the endogenous transporters of the cell. But when you express ALMT, you, ex you obtain, a, you obtain a, a magnitude of transport much higher, which is mediated by this transporter. But most importantly, when you expose them to, alien, to, to aluminum, to extracellular aluminum, what you obtain is, once again, an enhancement of the transport activity mediated by the ALMT1 channel. I'm not going to go into the biophysics of it, but basically we can perform all sorts of analysis based on the magnitudes of this current and the different voltages and substrates that we used. Which are, what I, what I want to summarize is that we do know that the ALMT1 one, as I showed you, is enhanced by the presence of extracellular aluminum. Second, it mediates negative currents, which are actually the product of malate moving from the inside of the cell into the outside of the cell. So he here we are. We have a transporter that mediates organic acid release, just like you would expect it in, in roots. And most importantly, it responds to the presence of aluminum. So we're interested in finding out what is it that determines that uh, aluminum enhancement property. And this is all I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. And it's what are the motifs or what are the parts of the protein that are actually responsible for sensing the aluminum in the extracellular phase. So what we have been doing is we have no structural knowledge of the LMT apart from secondary structure predictions. So we've taken, uh, originally we took a crude approach which is we started looking at truncations of the protein. So we started by removing the terminal 19 amino acids. And we expressed that truncated version of the protein into all sites. And we compared the transport properties relative to the unmodified protein. So when you truncate the last uh, 19 amino acids, basically, you get a transporter where the transport properties are not affected. The same is true if we remove up to residue 435, so basically expression of the first 435 residues, including this transmembrane domains plus part of the C tail, results in a transporter that is functionally active. However, when we remove uh, five amino acid acids more from the terminal region, what we obtain is a transporter that is no longer functional. We've lost the activity of the transporter, both the basal activity of the transporter and obviously as well as the enhanceability, of the, the enhanceability feature of the transporter. We know that the transporter is being targeted to the plasma membrane, so there's something about the folding that has been lost that surrenders the transporter uh, non-functional. Not surprisingly, when you keep doing more truncations around the CE terminal domain, we obtain transporters that are basically non-functional. What was surprising was upon removal of the entire C terminal domain, that long hydrophilic tail, what we obtain is a transporter that recovers its functionality. However, just, just the, the end terminus domain being expressed, being functional, it cannot be enhanced or it's not responsive to the presence of extracellular aluminum. So what that post, um, what, that, what that is telling us is the end terminus domain, this first half of the protein, underlies the permeation pathway which is not surprising seeing that it contains the transmembrane domains, forming the pore where the ions are going to flow through across the bilayer. But the question is, is this C-terminal domain, we know that it's not essential for protein functioning, but is it actually a domain that determines the aluminum enhanceability of the protein? So when we expressed ALMT, we're able to calculate a KM for the aluminum enhanceability of the transporter. Basically, it's concentration dependent. And around 5 micromolar, we're able to get 50% maximum activation or enhancement of the transport activity of the ALMT. What that is telling us is that that high affinity 
what it suggests is basically aluminum being Al3+, plus, most likely is binding to negatively charged residues in the protein. Thus, sorry? G, uh, we're measuring the, the conductance. So basically we look at the relationship between voltage and current and the slope of, of, of that relationship should tell you what the conductance or the transport rate of the transporter would be. So it's the, basically the conductance we obtain at a given uh, aluminum activity over the, the maximum conductance we're able to obtain. So what that, what that suggests is that Al3 plus is most likely binding to negative residues in the, in the transporter. So to evaluate the role of the C terminus of the LMT, what we did is we started neutralizing every single amino acid negative residue uh, in, in the C terminus of the LMT by changing aspartic acid either to asparagine or glutamic acid changing into glutamine. So basically we're neutralizing each one of those residues. We take each one of those single point mutations, we express them in all sites, and again we compare the influence or the potential change in the functionality of the transporter relative to the non-modified transporter. The data I'll, I'll be showing you just um, is just in regards to the responsiveness of, of the transporter. Whoopa, how did that happen? Wow. Where are we? Talk about freak. So we're somewhere around there, right? Okay. Jesus, stay away from it. <laughs> there we go. So all the, the all I'm going to be talking about is the changes in aluminum responsiveness. How much does the uh, responsiveness of each one of these transporters changes relative to a wild type, which we're going to we're calling 100% responsiveness. So what you can see is we we obtain a whole. Uh, variety of phenotypes in terms of the percentage of enhancement which goes from uh, transporters that are a little bit more responsive but overall most of the uh, single uh, mutations or most of the neutralizations result in transporters with lower responsiveness with a couple or a few transporters that have actually lost the responsiveness to aluminum. Another way of presenting you that data is is this way in terms of the magnitude of the responsiveness, but this is just to highlight that it's not a discrete response, but it's rather a very continuous response. So there are interesting residues like 274, 275, and 423, where we have actually lost the responsiveness of the transporter. And it's very tempting, and actually uh, the Japanese group proposed it initially to say, well, we have identified the residues <coughs> where aluminum is binding to the LMT, as soon as we neutralize them, aluminum can no longer bind to the LMT, thus it's no longer responsive to aluminum. However, we know that that's not the case. When, when you look at the distribution of those particular residues uh, throughout the entire 400 or so sequences so far known for the, alumina, uh, for the LMTs, what we see is that residues like 274, 275, or residues like 423, are actually highly conserved or entirely conserved throughout the entire LMT family. So most of this sequence includes LMTs which are not related to the aluminum uh, resistance response. So what we think is happening is among these residues, we have identified residues or we have mutated residues which are highly conserved and they are required actually for, uh, they're required for protein stability and proper functioning as a overall ALMT family and they actually have nothing to do with the aluminum binding to the transporter or with the phenotype of aluminum responsiveness. To prove, to prove this, uh, this hypothesis, what we did is we look for highly conserved residues throughout the entire family, residues which are not uh, negatively charged, such, such as the tryptophan here, tryptophan 283, and what we've done is we've done a, a single point substitution in that residue as well as a residue 218 or 431. But basically what we show is if you're able to uh, 
substitute those highly conserved residues, what you end up with is a series of transporters that are no longer as functional as the original ALMT. Therefore, we do believe that these residues, negative residues we identified originally, are more involved in overall protein stability, folding, and functionality rather than they having something to do with the aluminum responsiveness phenotype. So the next question we wanted to address was, can we move then the entire C terminus block? Uh, and the entire C terminus block is the one responsible for the aluminum responsiveness. So we have characterized several ALMTs. This is the one I've been talking about. It's aluminum enhanceable. We know that the homolog in Arabidopsis is also aluminum enhanceable. And the maize uh, ALMT1 is not aluminum enhanceable. So what we've done, done is we've done the, We've swapped the domains. Basically, we take the end terminus of this transporter and we attach the end terminus of this transporter. Or we can take the end terminus of this transporter and attach the C terminus of this transporter, resulting in this swap domain. <coughs> and that way, we've generated six different uh, swap domains. We express the cells, uh, we express these contracts in all sites, and we look at the changes in functionality. So, just to summarize all that data in a very colorful way, here I'm showing you once again the LMTs which are responsive and the LMTs which is not responsive. When you take the C terminal region of the responsive LMTs and you attach, attach them to the end terminus of a non-responsive LMT, what you obtain is no aluminum enhancement activity. So just the C block moved to a pore of a, of a different transporter is not able to uh, enhance the transport activity of that LMT. Likewise, if you take the C terminus from, from the non-responsive one, and you place it into the N terminus pore region of the two of the wheat and the Arabidopsis, what you obtain is actually an enhancement of the transport activity, which was quite pos uh, puzzling as we thought that the N terminus domain was not involved. Finally, when, when you swap them among the two responsive, uh, responsive ones, what you get is in some instances it's able to recover it, in the other construct it's not able to recover it. What that is telling us that the nature of the end terminal domain, which what we had discarded originally, is actually a determinant of aluminum enhanceability. So we decided to look at the end term domain in terms of the potential negative residues associated with, the, with that protein region. And once again, we perform single point mutations and we look at the changes in phenotype. Once again, we obtain a very continuous uh, changes in phenotype relative to the aluminum responsiveness. We obtained several residues which basically surrendered the, surrendered the transporter in a state where it's no longer enhanced by aluminum. I forgot mentioning that all the single point mutations that we've done actually result in transporters which are functionally active. They mediate the basal level. What varies is their degree of aluminum responsiveness. However, once again, when you look at this, at the, at the residues at this particular residues, what we find is they are highly conserved throughout the entire LNT family. So suggesting once again, we cannot attribute a role to these residues to the aluminum responsiveness of the protein, but rather we think they're involved in overall functioning and uh, stability of the LNT family. So the question is, uh, is it all lost? Was it a lot of uh, single point mutation analysis that led us nowhere? Mm, we took a different approach. So far, what I showed you is how we try to correlate the changes in, in a particular residue with the distribution throughout the entire family based on uh, sequences from genomic uh, efforts. Now, what we tried to look, the question we posed was, okay, let's, let's take a look at what, what's happening here in terms of the functionality, but are we able to find any domain on the set of ALMTs that have been functionally characterized? We have three LMTs that we know are responsive to aluminum, and we have a set of LMTs that are not responsive to aluminum. Can we find in sequence alignments any particular domain that might be unique to this set of LMTs? And the answer is yes. What we ended up finding is a motif right at the beginning of the protein, right at the extreme uh, end of the end term, we found a motif that is associated and is found uniquely in this set of LMTs which are uh, aluminum responsive. So this is how the motif looks. It's basically a highly conserved region of the first 12 amino acids with a variable region between 2 and uh, up to 35 residues. 
<coughs> Most interesting, when, when you, not, now we're walking back to the phylogenetic analysis, and we say, okay, let's look through all the phylogenetic, uh, through the 400 sequences that have been available at the moment, and see how this uh, identified mo motif is present in these clades. What we find is that out of the 403 sequences, we find 17 sequences that contain this motif. And interestingly, that motif is only contained in sequences that belong to clade one, which is the, the clade which accounts for this particular transporters. So everything seems to indicate that this motif might be associated with the uh, aluminum responsiveness of LMT. And this is current work that we're performing in the lab. What we've done is uh, we have removed that N, uh, that 35 amino acid motif, and we know that the LMT, upon removing this motif, is no longer functional. So it's no, well, it's functional, but it's no longer responsive to aluminum. However, if we remove the terminal eight, eight amino acids, we know that is, uh, the LMT is still responsive to aluminum. So we're still looking into, we're trying to dissect which, which of this entire motif actually co corresponds to the part or contains the part that makes the protein responsible. And that's what we're evaluating at, at the moment, a whole series of, of deletions of this motif. Also, what we're testing is we're taking that motif and we're doing a swap domain on an LMT, which is not aluminum responsive to see if insertion of this particular motif at the end terminus will bring back the responsiveness of the protein. So overall, summarizing what I've shown you is we started with a secondary prediction of the LMTs. We've done some topological work uh, and some um, turf work indicating they assemble as dimers. Uh, we know the topology is such that the, both the N and the C domains are contained to the inside of the, of the protein. What's still puzzling is if aluminum is interacting with the protein, how come it's interacting with domains which are contained within the inside of the protein, right? If, if the speciation of aluminum is such that at neutral pHs, aluminum precipitates as, as a hydroxide, how come aluminum might be getting into the cell and interacting with motifs located in a, in a region which is basically neutral pH? What we think is we have identified regions which are involved in the structural changes that take place uh, underlying the enhanceability of the transporter. However, the regions we have identified are not necessarily the regions where aluminum is interacting directly with the protein. And uh, all this has been done with any real structural knowledge of the LMT. Uh, we have just done it with uh, secondary structure predictions. But we are in urge, we need to get a crystal structure that allow us to place a uh, spatial structure, a crystal structure, a 3D model of the LMTs to be able to overlap all the functionality that we know uh, to basically to eluc elucidate what are the molecular determinants of the functionality of the LMT. So the other part that I never told you about is the other family of transporters, the, the mate transporters, which is a complete different story. They're regular in a different way and hopefully one day I'll get the chance to talk about it. So basically summarizing, I've shown you sort of a, a set of multidisciplinary approaches that have allowed us to initiate function structure analysis of membrane transporters, which are involved or mediate a particular abiotic stress response. This knowledge will allow us to potentially identify the allele of membrane transporters that are most effective in conferring aluminum resistance in crop plants and in the era of uh, genome editing, it's, it's, it's pretty plausible to propose that we should be able, with the knowledge of, of what are the domains that mediate aluminum enhancement in a particular uh, family of transporters, we should be able to engineer these membrane transporters in order to enhance their ability to confer aluminum tolerance, and thereby expanding their usage in available marginal soils. So finally, I just want to acknowledge a lot of people that have been involved, involved at different parts of this project. First of all, the old timers in the coaching lab. Thanks for all the help, technical help and the intellectual discussions. Particularly, I want to acknowledge people from, from my group, Alison, Ayalu, and Armand, who have carried part of, part of the work, as well as visiting scholars, international visiting scholars, rotating students from plant biology that have collaborated and 
added little bits and pieces to the puzzle, as well as uh, undergrads who have rotated during the summer through the plant genome research project that uh, BTI hosts over the summer. Also, collaborators, Ingo, uh, Ed, they're involved in uh, the phylogenetic analysis. As I mentioned, Ed is involved in the turf work. Uh, Jeffrey Chang is our right-hand man uh, in regards to, fun uh, to the structure and crystallization of transporters. And uh, Dave Snarri and Kuda are involved in uh, other work that I haven't present. So thank you very much. I finally want to acknowledge the funding from what used to be NRI. Nowadays is the, is the NIFA grant. And uh, thank you for your time. Um, have you estimated the single channel conductance for melee? Mm, no, we haven't. With, with the expression of ALTs, I haven't done any single channel. Because I looked at your turf, so you have some channel density yeah. that you can estimate. Right. And from your IV curves, I guess a trillion melates are going in per second. So I wonder if you could maybe you estimate that. You could do the correlation, yes. We haven't, uh, I haven't done any single channel work from, uh, from experiments to those sites. For those that are not familiar, basically single channel is, uh, you can actually isolate a little patch of the membrane <coughs> to measure the activity of a single molecule of that transport mm -hmm. and measure the transport rate. What we did do was uh, back in the early 2000s, we did a lot of patch mapping, looking at uh, the transport activity in protoplasm from maize. And from that, we detected a, we characterized a anion current, which basically accounts for the release of intracellular uh, anions into the extracellular part of the protoplast. And we did single channel work with that, and uh, I believe it was a conductance of around 20 to 30 picosiemens in those ionic conditions. And what we know is that that channel isolated in patches also was dependent on the presence of uh, extracellular aluminum. Basically, the, pop, the patch is quiet if you remove aluminum, but as soon as you bring aluminum, single channel activity appears, which is consistent with the activity of all But no, I haven't done any, any single channel work. Do you, have, do you have any estimates of the channel density from the turf? No. So I'm curious, I know getting crystal structure obviously be a wonderful approach to this, but in lieu of that, if you look to see whether that N-terminal domain that you've identified is potentially be some involvement in the um, are there similar structures in other transport proteins involved in cation binding that could give you some clues? Not for that particular domain. So there's something unique about that domain. Yes, it's okay. pretty frustrating to work with you know, these guys. When you work like for mates, you just simply put your sequence out here and you get three, four different crystal structures. So all you have to do is take your sequence, thread it through those crystal structures, right? Through those predictions, and you get a, a nice homology model. You throw it in the T's, chopping hand, you throw just the internal domains, you get nothing. It's a family unique, unique to the plant kingdom. All the more reason to get the crystal structure. Sorry? All the more reason to get the crystal structure. All the more reason to get that, uh, you get that brand funded, yeah. right? In the LMTs, uh, no, I mean, yes, there are a couple of substitutions, at least for the Week one, originally they had proposed there are two different alleles, and uh, they differ, I think it's like two or four amino acids. Uh, originally they had proposed for working all sides that uh, there was a functional difference among them, but uh, but we have done the work and basically the transport is the same as kind of expression. So no, we don't. Which would be nice to have. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.